Okay, thank you for joining us today and a very warm welcome to this free uh, Mammal Society webinar on the Volunteer Mountain Hare Survey. Um, it's a short one today, we should be done in about half an hour, we'll stay on if there's uh, questions to cover. Um, but you've got me, Matt larsen Dorr, CEO of the Mammal Society, and we're delighted to have Scott Newey with us from the Game and Wildlife Conservation Trust, who I'm going to hand over to very shortly. Um, before I do, just a little bit of housekeeping. Um, you are very welcome to ask questions at any point uh, as uh, Scott and I run through our slides. Um, just use the Q&A function, um, which is should be an option for you on your Zoom menu. Um, and we'll be able to pick those up and run through them at the end. Um, if you have anything else you'd like to say, please do use the chat um, and just introduce yourself or, or just say um, experiences you've had, um, things that you've already tried to do, project links, everything's welcome. Um, before I start, just a little bit about the Mammal Society in case you're not aware of our work. Um, we are a uh, British Isles focused conservation organisation um, whose vision is a future in which sustainable mammal populations thrive as part of healthy and diverse ecosystems that benefit people and nature across the British Isles. Um, our mission uh, is threefold. We work to ensure a bright future for mammals in the British Isles by inspiring, informing, supporting and enhancing conservation projects and policies that protect and restore native mammal populations and their habitats. We empower conservationists, students, citizen scientists and nature champions to play a key role in mammal conservation now and in the future through providing training, resources and also survey activations, which of course we're going to talk about today. And we seek to build public awareness of and support for mammal conservation through education, communications and campaigns. Um, and if you would like to support our work, I'll say a little bit at the end about how you can do that. Um, it's really helpful um, if you have the Mammal Mapper app installed on your phone um, or your device before we start this webinar. Don't worry if you haven't, however, um, we'll run through uh, what you need to do to get set up and to use that app. Um, if you're going to run uh, the mountain hare survey in your area or during your holiday um, and you can refer back to this webinar because we are recording it and we will circulate the link um, afterwards. So without further ado, I'm going to stop sharing my screen and I'm going to pass over to Scott, who's going to tell us a little bit about the mountain hare as a species and the rationale for the volunteer mountain hare survey. And then I'll come back in when Scott's finished uh, to give you a bit of a how to guide in how to get involved and get started uh, running the survey. Okay, uh, good afternoon. I hope you can all hear me and can see my screen. Uh, thank you and thank you Matt for the opportunity to come along this afternoon and tell you a little bit about mountain hares and why we need help uh, to monitor uh, their populations. So my name's Scott Newey. I'm a senior scientist in the Game and Wildlife Conservation Trust's uh, Scottish Upland Research uh, Team. I've had the good fortune to spend a lot of time over the past 25 years carrying out research on mountain hares, their populations, uh, ecology, and increasingly how we uh, effectively monitor uh, their populations. Um, so this is normally about an hour talk, which I've tried to condense down to about uh, 10 to 15 minutes. So um, I hope it's still uh, informative and coherent. So over the next 10 to 15 minutes, I'll give you a very brief introduction to uh, mountain hares, uh, their identification, their distribution in Scotland, population cycles, and particularly the implications that they have for their monitoring. Uh, the conservation status of mountain hares as we currently understand it, and the need for uh, better monitoring. So the mountain hare that we have in Scotland um, is uh, Lepus timidus uh, scoticus. It is the only native British lagomorph uh, within the British Isles. Uh, there is evidence that it has been present in uh, Britain for at least the last 100,000 years, although not continuously, of course, they've been on and off as their glaciers have come and gone. The other two species of lagomorph we have, uh, the rabbit and the brown hare are of course introduced species. The brown hare was probably introduced sometime around about uh, the time the Romans were here, though possibly earlier. And it's generally accepted the rabbits probably came in uh, with, with the Normans around about sort of a, a thousand years or so ago. But they are now nativized introduced species. 
the Scottish mountain hare is most closely related to the alpine subspecies of hare, Lepus timidus veronis, uh, which is smaller than the Scandinavian mountain hare and the Irish mountain hare. The Irish mountain hare, of course, is more closely related to the Scandinavian mountain hare uh, than the alpine mountain hare. So typically the mountain hares we have in Scotland are generally quite relatively small. Males are around about 2.5 kilos. Females are around about 2.9 kilos. Adults, that is, in, in summer. And they're around about 40 to 60 centimeters in body length. Though, of course, there's a lot of um, individual and seasonal variation around those measurements. But when, they, when they're sitting, uh, they're usually about, just about 30 centimeters um, tall. They're obviously um, herbivores. They preferentially eat uh, grass if they have the, the opportunity to, but they are able to eat and actually thrive on poor quality uh, and woody vegetation. One of the remarkable things about imagine hair ecology is they actually accumulate uh, body condition and body fat uh, du during the winter, uh, ready for the breeding season um, early, in, early in the spring, summer. They are largely nocturnal or uh, crepuscular in their behavior, and they're active and usually feed at night. Uh, they're generally inactive uh, during daylight, and they'll, they'll shelter either in a shallow scrape in the ground or a, 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 sort of a short, small cave uh, in taller vegetation, or sometimes they'll just sit uh, in the lee of the hill uh, out of the wind. However, imagine hares can be active uh, during the day, particularly during the breeding season, and in the summer, you know, we have 20 hours of daylight uh, up here in the, in the summer, uh, so hares are and can be seen to be active during daylight hours uh, too but they're generally most active during the night. So the identification, uh, the mountain hares generally have a, in their summer coat, is it's a gray brown or a brownish color, although it can also be a sort of slightly slaty uh, gray at times. They are one of the three UK vertebrate species to molt to white in, during the winter. Uh, the ptarmigan and the stoat, of course, being the other two uh, species. They're characterized by a relatively short um, ear. That's a, an adaption for, uh, to cope with the colder conditions and have a sh black tip uh, to the ears, which is present um, all year round. Uh, mountain hares have an all white tail um, all year round too. And if you ever get good enough, you have mountain hares that actually have a brown uh, mountain, brown eyes. The brown hare is, of course, substantially larger than the mountain hare, typically around about four to five kilos. It has a brown fur with more sort of an orangey brown sides all year round, with much longer uh, black tipped ears. Apparently, if you pull the uh, brown hare's ears forwards, so they will touch its nose. And what I read when I was preparing for this uh, talk, which I didn't know before, they're very long ears. Uh, the tail is black on the upper side all year round, unlike the mountain hares. And uh, brown hairs can get close enough have amber colored eyes. I generally think that the brown hair is more of a, a gangly, uh, lanky uh, animal compared to the more compact nature uh, of the mountain hare. And the rabbit, of course, which I imagine you were all familiar with, is it, much smaller. It has short ears, about the same length as the head, without the black tips that the mountain hare and the brown hare have. And the rabbit has a far more uniform gray brown fur um, all year all year round. Um, it's not always easy, to be honest, to distinguish between uh, mountain hares and, and brown hares. Um, if you're not that familiar with them, their ranges do overlap. Uh, in my office, I will see mountain hares and brown hares on my, my drive-in uh, to the office. And it, it's not always easy in a poor light or at a distance to, to distinguish them. But you, you can usually if you get a decent uh, view of them. Distribution, so uh, mountain hares are widely distributed uh, in Scotland. Uh, they are strongly associated with upland heather moorland that is managed for grouse shooting, where mountain hares are thought to benefit from habitat management and predator control carried out as part of grouse moor management. And in the central part of their, their northeastern distribution on grouse moors, they can reach incredibly high densities. And at the peak of peak population densities of 100 or 200 hares per square kilometer uh, is not that unusual. They are present, however, throughout uh, other areas of Scotland, uh, particularly in the, the Alpine zone, the high, high mountains, uh, throughout the northwest of Scotland, and in some lowland areas where they typically occur at much lower densities 
of sort of around about two to four hairs, or maybe up to 10 hairs uh, per square kilometer. However, the distribution and density of the mountain hares outside of the northeast of Scotland, this area of their core part of their range were around the Cairngorms National Park and outside of areas managed for grouse shooting are really not very well uh, understood at all. You know, it appears the mountain hares are probably far more, more widely distributed than we previously understood. And one of the motivations for the volunteer mountain hare survey is to try and get a much wider coverage of mountain hare um, surveys and to try and see whether hares are in areas we wouldn't traditionally expect them uh, to occur in. So I'm going to talk very briefly about the population cycles and the implication for their monitoring. Mountain hares in Scotland, like their cousins in Scandinavia uh, and the Alps, and indeed throughout their Euro-Asian uh, distribution, are characterized uh, by population cycles. When we talk about population cycles, we talk about these irregular interannual, multi-annual uh, fluctuations in density. Mountain hares in Scotland, well, at least certainly in the northeast of Scotland, uh, showed a, around about a 10-year population cycle, which means that over the course of, a, of 10 years, the mountain hare densities will go from peak to peak or from, from trough to trough. They'll go from very high densities, uh, as I said before, from 100 or 200 hares per square kilometre of peak density to low density of a few tens of hares per square kilometre around about five years later. And then over the next five years, the population will increase to, uh, to another peak density. Uh, these cycles are quite noisy cycles uh, in Scotland, and they do change regionally. So as you move further south in Scotland, these population cycles become uh, uh, much shorter in their periodicity, and also the amplitude, the difference between the lower part of the population cycle and the peak uh, becomes less. I mean, population cycles have uh, fascinated uh, ecologists for probably 100 years uh, since Elton, uh, it's really the uh, sort of the more practical implications I'm going to talk about now, and that is that these population cycles make monitoring uh, any species, but particularly um, these smaller sort of semi-cryptic animals, incredibly uh, difficult. And you really need consistent uh, time series of data to have a decent understanding of what might be happening to the populations. I mean, these two graphs here on the right uh, just show sub subsections of the, the graph on the left. And as you can see, depending on which part of the time series you look at, uh, you can, might draw very different conclusions about what might be happening to the population. If you only have the short time series here on the left, you might be worried the mountain hares are rapidly heading for extinction. Whereas if you have this middle part of the time series, you, know, you might be worried about you're about to be overrun by mountain hares. Whereas if you have a, a, an incomplete time series, you may conclude that there's nothing very much interesting at all is happening. Uh, uh, to mountain hares. So in order to get a robust understanding of what might be happening to mountain hares, we really need a long-term data sets that have been collected using a consistent methodology um, uh, over their entire range uh, of their distribution in Scotland. And is this a challenge of understanding their long-term population trend, I think is reflected in some of their, um, the, uh, their conservation status, their protection and their legal uh, status. So globally, mountain hares are classified by the IUCN as a species of least concern, although there is acknowledgement that in some areas, the species is under threat from habitat loss, over-exploitation and competition and hybridization with the brown hare. In Britain and Scotland, uh, the recent work led by Fiona Math Matthews a few years ago applied the IUCN, IUCN uh, classification uh, to all the UK mammals and concluded that the mountain hare was classed as, as near threatened in Britain and Scotland. The mountain hare is on the Scottish biodiversity list and categorised as a species where particular consideration needs to be given to avoid significant negative uh, impacts. The mountain hare is listed in Annex 5 of the EC Habitats Directive, which requires signatory states to maintain each species in a favourable conservation status. The last reporting and Article 17 of the Habitats Directive in 2019 concluded that the Scottish mountain hare population was unfavourable, uh, inadequate 
which was a downgrading of their conservation status compared to the previous three reporting periods. Partly, I think, reflecting uh, these concerns about the conservation status, particularly the downgrading of the conservation status of mountain hares and wider public concern about the sustainable management of mountain hares. In March 2021, mountain hares were given full protection and were included in Schedule 5 of the Wildlife Countryside Act of 1981 as amended, uh, which prohibits the killing, injury or taking of mountain hares without a license. Prior to this, of course, mountain hares were a legal game species in Scotland and could be legally killed for sport or population control uh, within a defined um, open uh, season. However, we have to remember that there is no systematic dedicated monitoring of mountain hares in Scotland or indeed anywhere else in the UK. And as all of the assessments of mountain hares uh, population conservation status rely on and are thereby hampered by the use of indices of population size based on incidental data from surveys primarily intended to survey other species. So all of the discussion around the needs for the protection of mountain hares and their conservation status and what we need to do to protect mountain hares is all based on less than perfect uh, information. And it's very much for this reason uh, and which is what motivated the volunteer mountain hare survey is really to try and collect uh, far better uh, data on the distribution and the numbers of mountain hares throughout their entire range in, in Scotland uh, to better inform policy and the conservation measures needed. And really the only, this requires a, a massive um, effort. Uh, the mountain hares are small, semi-cryptic, largely nocturnal, they show these population cycles, uh, and so they're a very difficult uh, animal to survey. And that is really why we, uh, or a number of organizations have come together uh, to try to promote uh, the widespread monitoring of mountain hares uh, using systematic uh, methods so that we can build up a much stronger and robust and evidence-based picture of uh, the status of their conservation status and identify any conservation measures that are needed. So I think that's pretty much all I had to say. Uh, a list of some further information here if anyone wants to uh, dig deeper. Um, other than that, um, thank you very much. Uh, happy to take questions. Thanks, Scott. Fantastic. Um, I'll crack straight on if if that's okay with the with the how of the survey. If you've got questions for Scott or anything um, uh, about the, the content that I'm going to share now, uh, please do uh, post it in the Q&A um, and, and do uh, introduce yourself and, and chat in the chat if you would like, and then we'll cover everything that comes up um, at the end. Um, so let me reshare my screen. Um, so as I mentioned at the start, um, quite a lot of what I talk about will refer uh, to uh, the Mammal Mapper app, which is a free app that you can download onto uh, Apple or Android devices if you haven't already done so. Um, so do please uh, sort of do that um, if you're going to get involved um, and, and everything that I now say will hopefully make sense. Um, but very quickly, what I'm going to run through, um, having had the the why, um, uh, why we're monitoring mountain hare, why it's important, um, and uh, a little bit about the species from Scott, I'm going to give you the how you can get involved. Um, and it's it's really clear that the more people we can get involved surveying in more sites um, more regularly, uh, the better the data, which allows conservation organisations uh, like ours to inform policy uh, and also to inform land practice um, and other decisions that can affect um, mountain hare and other species. Um, so when you have download, the downloaded Mammal Mapper, the first thing that you'll need to do if you're planning to get involved in the mountain hare survey is go to uh, the, the little more button on the home screen and select settings and actually toggle on a special setting, which is the volunteer mountain hare survey option. Uh, that's there because there's certain functionality that we've actually introduced to the app um, for this, but it's only really applicable if you're in Scotland and you're and you're taking part in the Mountain Hare Survey. So we didn't want those options to confuse other users. Um, and then you can return to the home, you can start a survey, uh, and you'll have various options, which I'm going to cover um, over the next few slides. 
So when you open the Mammal Mapper app, um, and this is an app that you can have uh, on your phone and use it whenever you're out and about, whenever you see any signs of mammals or you spot a mammal, whether it's a deer, a rabbit, um, a hare, um, anything that you might spot on your uh, on, on your hill walking. Um, and uh, all of that data is invaluable um, for conservation. So please do submit it and it goes through into um, the Mammal Mapper database. And from the Mammal Mapper database, it goes into iRecord and into the National Biodiversity Network's um, UK-wide um, biodiversity database. Really useful data. Um, so you can do that even if you're not going out specifically to conduct a survey for the Mountain Hare Survey. However, if you are planning to take part, and if you're uh, in Scotland, then um, any ramble, any uh, hill walking, um, any drive anywhere else uh, in Scotland um, gives you the opportunity to contribute, so please do. Um, as I say, click on more and you'll find uh, under settings that there's this special toggle uh, that you, you can turn on to conduct the Volunteer Mountain Hare Survey. The main thing that that does is it ensures that you get some information um, about uh, how you can take part in the survey and why we're doing it. Um, but it also means that as well as monitoring for mountain hare as you walk, um, you'll also be able to record sightings of birds that you see. And this uh, is a partnership as well as with the Mammal Society and the Game Wildlife Conservation Trust. Um, we also have BTO, the British Ornithology Trust, um, and they're obviously focused on birds um, as well as other wildlife. Um, and it's really, really useful to know um, where, as we understand um, the, the dissemination and the population um, level of mountain hares in different areas, um, to know what else is in that ecosystem um, and how that might have correlation or causation um, for mountain hare survival. Um, you are not expected to be an expert um, in uh, every species, um, uh, of either mammal or birds. Um, and you will have the opportunity in the Mammal Mapper app to kind of say, actually, if you feel that you're a beginner and you're just going to be using the, the guidance in the app to do as best you can when it comes to identifying what you spotted, um, or if you're actually, um, you've got a qualification or you're, or you're an expert or a confident twitcher, in which case we want to know that because it means that we can uh, you know, really rely on the data that you submit. So, when you are out and about, um, you'll be able to access, as well as the uh, the Mammal Mapper functionality to record your sightings, um, you can also access um, information that can help you to take part. So um, there is an ID guide built into Mammal Mapper where uh, you'll find information on all uh, British mammal species um, and the birds that have been included for the Mountain Hare Survey. Um, so if you dip into the, the Mountain Hare record, um, you can just search for it. Um, you'll find image references, you'll find some information um, uh, similar to, to uh, the details that Scott shared earlier. Uh, you'll see pictures of what their droppings look like. Um, they're obviously not very recent droppings because that's an old pound coin, but you get a sense of the, the size and the texture. And you'll even see uh, what to look for if you find tracks. Um, and then, as I said, you'll also find similar information on the bird species that we've included for this survey. Um, when you uh, are ready to start your survey, um, you can choose between three different types. Um, one is uh, just called an ad hoc uh, sighting, which is similar to how you would normally use Mammal Mapper if you just have it in your pocket and you're out walking and you spot something that you want to record. Um, that means that you just um, enter your, uh, your finding, your re record, and you submit it. So it doesn't mean that you were out there looking for mountain hare, it just means you did spot signs of mountain hare, you did spot a mountain hare, and that's obviously really useful uh, to log on Mammal Mapper. However, there are more useful ways that you can actually survey, um, and the first of those is a, a ramble survey. So when you open the Mammal Mapper app and you click on Start Survey, um, you're faced with this screen here, and you can choose what kind of survey you're actually going to undertake. So under Survey ID, um, there are lots of options, and one of them uh, is Hair Ramble, and then there are others that also start with Hair that, that I'll explain in a bit. If you're doing a Hair Ramble survey, that just means you are out walking um, in uh, the Highlands, um, and you are looking out for mountain hair and signs of mountain hair. And that means that even when you don't see mountain hair, it's recorded on Mammal Mapper that you did walk that route and you did um, not see anything, which is useful data in its own right. Otherwise, we have no idea whether 
absence of data, absence of sightings of mountain hare is evidence that there aren't mountain hare there or just that no one's been there to look. So this is why this kind of survey is really valuable. Um, if you then start your ramble as you're walking along, you don't just uh, record sightings of mountain hare, you can record sightings of any mammals that you see. So for example, in this case, I started this walk on Friday, um, I saw rabbit holes. In fact, I did also see live rabbits, but I wasn't quick enough with my phone to take a picture. Um, so I thought, well, that's that's useful to record because then if I see mountain hare later on, we'll know that there's a cohabiting in the ecosystem. Um, so I've uploaded two photos that I took. I've put uh, next and then I get to say what kind of observation I've made. Um, so I, although I did also record a, a spotted mammal, in this case, I've uploaded pictures of the holes that I saw and I've put den burrow. And then I carry on um, on my ramble um, and it will allow me to either just record uh, my GPS position if I'm standing right by uh, where I made the observation or I can actually move that uh, cursor around on the map. So if I've um, walked on while I've been um, fiddling with my phone, um, I can still uh, move that cursor back uh, and, and put it exactly where I saw um, that particular mammal or the sign of mammal. So really useful, um, very uh, intuitive um, and, and quite straightforward and then you just click next and it's entered. Um, your uh, ramble route will be tracked so when you have kind of got to the point when you you finished your your uh, survey um, just make sure that you click submit survey at the end and um, so all of that data goes to Mammal Mapper and comes back to us. Um, if you are planning to do a uh, going out specifically to take part in the mountain hare survey, there's an even more useful uh, kind of survey that you can do, which is called a square survey. Um, so you'll find the link uh, from the same uh, information page on the Mammal Society's website, but it will actually take you through to the BTO website um, who have done uh, the setup for the square surveys. Um, and if you do this and you click through, you will find uh, that you can click through and select the square that you're actually going to go and survey before you actually go out and do it. So ramble survey is just, you know, if you're out and about in the highlands because you love nature, because you live um, in, in the highlands uh, and, you know, even just your, your walk um, down the road or with the dog um, is, is in one of these sites. And then you can just do a ramble survey. But if you can go out and actually select a square, and then that's really valuable um, for us. And I'm just going to click through to the site so I can show you what this looks like in practice. So the whole of the highlands pretty much is covered um, by these squares. Um, and if you're going to uh, go out and, and conduct a survey, you can click uh, the place which you can get to um, and select the square that you're going to, uh, to survey in advance. Um, but if you zoom in, you'll find that there are also some red squares selected by the BTO. And now the reason why there is this distribution of red squares is because it's probably unrealistic that we will have every one of these little squares within the larger green ones um, surveyed by volunteers. Um, uh, we don't have that many people in the highlands um, that will go out and not all of these places are accessible. But if we can actually get each of these red squares surveyed, we'd actually get really useful representative data. And they've been selected um, more or less at random, but with some control um, to make sure they're appropriate. Um, so they're not selected because they're particularly easy to get to or particularly beautiful. They're selected because overall, these red squares will represent a wide range of habitat and the area across the highlands. So if you can find a red square that hasn't been claimed already by somebody um, that you can get to, that would be the most valuable way that you can take part in the mountain hare survey. Um, so I've already uh, done one of these red squares, um, however, I'm just going to browse to where I live and select a square so you can see what would happen uh, if you volunteer yourself um, to take part. So let me just browse over here. So I live on the banks of Loch U, um, which is all covered by this grid. Um, I did that red square survey that you can see over there, which is why this whole green area is um, uh, is greyed out. Um, it doesn't mean that you can't uh, go and conduct a survey in that area, the more the merrier, um, but it does mean that there are other more priority areas now to ensure we get the coverage. Um, and I can select one of these squares that I know I can get to easily. And 
I can put my name and email address in and I can request that square. And that means that uh, it's logged that someone is going to survey that square and anyone else coming here uh, to select a square that they'll survey might choose a different one to make sure that they're, they're uh, providing more useful data rather than replicating what's already been done. When you signed up for a square, you will receive a very helpful email. Oops, sorry. That's going to keep on happening. I need to use the controls here. Uh, you'll find a very useful email comes through uh, with some links um, to useful resources that you can download um, and some instructions for taking part in the survey and a reminder of which square you signed up for. Um, you'll be able to use those links to download things like an OS, uh, an Ordnance Survey map of your square, um, which you can then match with your own Ordnance Survey app maps or, or a paper map if you have one. Um, and just check that you know exactly where uh, you're meant to be doing it. You'll also find that there's downloadable paper survey forms um, just so that you can have those ready to record your findings just in case your phone runs out of battery uh, or you have IT problems or if you actually just prefer to have a clipboard and a pen um, than referring to your phone. Um, then when you go out, uh, you'll be selecting the hair square as your survey type. Um, and you start it just as you did with a ramble. Um, but what you aim to do within your square that you've opted to survey is actually do two lines, um, about a kilometre, ideally, um, of, of just walking and seeing everything that you can. Um, you're in the Scottish Highlands, so the chances are it won't be a perfect straight line. It might end up more like a banana shape. Uh, or it might be wiggly because you have to go around um, uh, through gates and around bogs um, and uh, over streams um, and you might be blocked at times but you do the best you can and then you try and do another line that crosses the first so if you do those two lines of survey within your square um, and you've recorded that on the app um, or with your paper recording then that is really fantastically useful data if you find uh, one of the problems you might have with the Mammal Mapper app um, is if you fall out of GPS service um, or if you use an app that also requires the GPS service and it kind of gazumps Mammal Mapper, it could um, bring your survey to a halt when you're halfway through it. Um, that can feel really frustrating, but don't worry because the data that you have collected so far is not lost. And what you'll find is if you just restart Mammal Mapper um, and, and click on Start Survey, it will tell you that an unsaved survey has, has been um, recorded already and you can submit that before you start again. So everything that you've done so far will be recorded and you can just carry on from where you left off um, starting it as a new survey. When you've finished uh, conducting your survey and you've got back home, um, one of the links in that very helpful email that you'll have received will allow you to log um, that you did that. Um, and so that just lets BTO know um, that that's where uh, you pledged you would do it, you did do it, it's been done, it's been finished on that date, and the data should be in Mammal Mapper. Uh, and so if you just go through, it's just a one-click process, as you can see, just to put the date that you did the survey and you click Submit. So it's as simple as that. Um, that is uh, the kind of walkthrough that I wanted to give you. Um, I'm hoping that's all fairly clear, but I'm really happy uh, to answer any questions. And if you've got any questions for Scott on the uh, the mountain hare species um, and some of the background that he gave and some of the rationale behind the survey, we'd be delighted to answer that too. So negotiating my way back. So we've got one question in the Q&A. So let me just stop sharing my screen. From Amy, um, are the Mammal Society considering kickstarting these surveys in the uplands of England, for example, the Dark Peak? Um, so, Scott, you might have some thoughts on that as well, but I'll answer that as well. Um, so the mountain hare survey is specifically looking at the highlands for various reasons that, that Scott outlined. However, the data, obviously, mountain hares do um, don't know that there's a border between Scotland and England. Um, and uh, the brown hare and mountain hare territories do overlap, um, particularly uh, in the borderlands. Um, and that's really useful data as well. So we'd really encourage anybody um, who's in the uplands of England um, or the north of England to um, really keep an eye out for mountain hare, familiarise themselves with the differences between the species and to record that on Mammal Mapper. But this particular survey and the data that's being collected um, through this particular methodology is specific uh, to the highlands um, and it's part funded um, and uh, 
steered by Nature Scott, um, who are obviously looking at the conservation of the species across Scotland. Do you have anything else to add to that, Scott? Okay, great. Thanks, Amy. Anyone else got anything they would like to uh, throw in before we finish? Just to give you some time uh, to think, I will just share my screen again and just finish off with a few points. Uh, so just to say, um, if you found this webinar useful or if you like the idea of just um, contributing to science when you're out and about, uh, enjoying nature and out in the landscape, um, please do consider uh, joining the Mammal Society to support our vital work. Um, and you'll as well as um, getting updates um, and a, a seasonal magazine called Mammal News um, about our project, but also mammal science and conservation. Um, you'll also get reduced price tickets on our uh, range of training courses, which are really fantastic. In fact, if you are looking at any of our training courses, um, which are um, from signs of mammals, identifying signs of mammals when you're out and about for very beginners, all the way up to specialist uh, dormice handling, courses for ecological consultants. Um, if you're going to do any of our training courses, um, sign up as a member, you will get your membership feedback um, on the savings that you make from just one course. Uh, you'll also get reduced price access to our annual conference um, and also a say in Mammal Society decisions at our annual general meeting. And if you would like to donate just to support our work, um, we, we try and keep uh, at least um, one of our webinars uh, each month free um, and we do lots of education work and uh, free trainings for our local groups um, or, or on top of our training course. Uh, so all donations are very welcome. OK, I've got uh, one more question before we finish, which is from Ro. Hi, Matt. How long will the mountain hare survey go on? We're getting into the stalking season now when access is more difficult. Is there a cutoff date? Uh, so that's a really good question. Um, no, the, uh, the answer is, uh, Although there is obviously um, funding for the project, which goes year by year, um, the real value of this is in continuing it long term um, for exactly the reason that Scott laid out uh, when he was looking at those trends um, of, of mountain hare population uh, dips and, and troughs versus peaks. Um, so it's really, really important that we sustain interest um, and engagement um, the amount of data is really valuable. So if people are traveling uh, to the Highlands for a holiday and next year they're going to go to Tenerife, we still would like those people to, to take part um, and, and tick off some of those squares. And then hopefully the next year we'll get other people doing it. But um, it's particularly valuable if uh, people who live in the Highlands um, and actually walk the hills uh, quite regularly um, can commit to doing a square or, or doing a number of squares that are close to them year on year. So when you've done it once, um, you know, in, in the year, you, you might walk that route again. And, and if you did spot anything, it would be great to record it. But you might not sort of go out and do another uh, square survey with the two uh, routes that cross each other. Um, but the next year, we really would hope that you would do it again because it's really valuable. Um, so, yeah, it's just open. Um, and obviously it gets pretty tricky in the Highlands to go out in the middle of winter. Uh, but in some cases, um, those... Uh, you know, the mountain hares can be even easier to spot if it hasn't snowed yet and they've gone white for the winter. Um, so if you live locally and you can choose a good day to go out safely, um, then again, really valuable um, to collect that data. Is that all right, Scott? Anything you want to add to that? No, nothing to add. I mean, yeah, any the more data, the, the better. <laughs> OK. Well, thanks so much for joining us, everyone. This was recorded, so this will be available to reference. Um, and uh, if you think that anyone uh, in your local community or your local network might be interested in taking part in the Mountain Hare Survey, particularly if you know anyone that goes out anyway and goes walking in the hills um, and, and enjoys the landscapes in the highlands, please do share this information with them. Um, it's a fun thing to do with somebody. Um, and it's also great if more people are going out and taking part. So without further ado, a huge thank you to Scott for joining today um, and for sharing such uh, valuable information about the species um, and the background to mountain hare. And thanks to all of you for giving up your lunch, a lunch break, probably in some cases, uh, to join us. And I look forward to seeing your records on Mammal Mapper 
or uh, receiving them on paper forms. Thank you very much.